All right. Welcome, everyone. I hope you're all having a good evening. And we have a really great guest lecture for you tonight. Um, I, I'm Jun Lee, first of all. Uh, I'm a first year MFA student in printmaking, and I'm the current visiting artist liaison. And I'd like to thank the Walton Family Foundation and the Joy Pratt Markham Endowment, who make this lecture series possible. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our wonderful guest artist for tonight, Paul Sapuya. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous history of the land that this University of Arkansas sits on. Across this expanse of time, many successive groups have lived here and created sacred legacies in this area. Fulbright College acknowledges indigenous peoples who were forced to leave their ancestral lands, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapa nations with ties to Northwest Arkansas. We further recognize that a portion of the Trail of Tears runs through our campus and that the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations passed through what is now Arkansas during this forced removal. We acknowledge all indigenous teachers, researchers, and all other residents in our community and region today. And now I'll be introducing Paul Sapuya. So Paul is an artist working in photography his projects weave together histories and possibilities of portraiture, queer and homoerotic networks of production and collaboration, and the material and conceptual potential of blackness at the heart of the medium. His interests also include queer literary modernism, questions of artistic responsibility and care regarding representation and refusal. Paul Sapuya has been artist in residence at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, the Center for Photography at Woodstock, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Fire Island Artist Residency. His work is in the permanent collections of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, MOCA Los Angeles, the MoMA, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, the Getty Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the International Center for Photography, among others. He has also exhibited extensively, including at the 2019 Whitney Biennial, at the Museum of Modern Art, at Photo Museum Amsterdam, at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, and the University of Houston Blaffer Art Museum, just to name a few. His work has also been covered and published in Art Forum, Aperture, The New Yorker, The New York Times, Art Review, Freeze, Art in America, Monocle, Osmos, The Nation, and The Guardian. He is currently the Acting Associate Professor in Media Arts at the University of California in San Diego. So now I'm going to tur be turning things over to Paul and our panel of undergraduate and graduate students. We are following a slightly different format tonight for our lecture for those of you who are familiar with the way things usually work. So in order to make this more of a conversation, each member of our panel will be asking a question of Paul related to the themes of the studio community and dissemination of the work. We also hope to have some time at the end of the discussion for audience questions. So please, I highly encourage you to take advantage of this and pop some questions down into the Q&A function. So now I'll turn this over to Paul. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, I hope everyone is well out there. Um, I'm here in Los Angeles. Uh, anyways, I'm gonna, let me start sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to do, yeah, something a little bit different today. And I, so I really appreciate y'all going with, um, with letting me try something else out. Can you see my, um, my screen? Looks good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm also doing this on the fly. I was like, up until 15 minutes ago, I was like, what am I going to talk about really briefly? Um, so I'm going to kind of just do an overview of this idea of thinking about just like the, the ways in which this, the studios function as a stage. I have an exhibition that's opening in Chicago next week called Stage. So I was sort of thinking about this. Um, and I hope this will touch on a lot of other um, things that are happening in my work um, uh, that'll just kind of introduce some ideas, but also I will have other images and material and stuff like that. So as questions come up, do feel free to talk about 
bring bring in references to any other things because I will be able to share some of that that um, other sort of like related work. Okay, so let's see how this goes. Um, you know, I guess one thing I want to say is I've been, uh, gosh, I've been making this work for about like this this image that you're seeing here from 2006. It's from one of the er first projects that I did. Um, where I began making portraits in the years after I completed undergrad in 2004, um, making photographs with my within kind of like my first kind of community of of mostly like queer gay friends in New York City, mostly Brooklyn, but also kind of extending across um, through zine collaboration and culture and all of that stuff in the early, I guess you call this, was this the aughts? I don't know what that decade was called. Um, and, but something I'm thinking about as, as I have moved towards this idea of, of the stage, which is also, um, builds off of this idea of this exhibition that I did in 2019 in New York City called The Conditions. I've been thinking about all of the, the structures that surround the production of portraiture. Something that I've always been really interested in is like the ways in which the production and the dissemination of portraiture, particularly in like in um, uh, in queer communities becomes not only a form of currency, but a form of communication, of solicitation, of collaboration, of, um, of erotic exchange, of, of social, you know, all of these things. And so I've, I, I quickly moved from this, from my earliest work of thinking about the photograph as some sort of like definitive um, uh, 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 capturing of an identity of a person to thinking about all of the complications around uh, uh, of the spaces that it's moving into and what the portrait and, and that work kind of brings back to the artist and the subject. You also start to see something that happens kind of going from this earliest work in um, which was made in home to moving into the site, the space of a studio. The, the home was sort of premised on this idea or, or something that I had taken for granted of the, of the familiarity, the comfort and the intimacy of, of making portraits of friends in the same space in which we would be hanging out, having beers, listening to Beyonce, having house parties, whatever, that I was not using a traditional sort of photo studio, but what was immediate to me. In 2010 and 11, I started making work in a studio at the Studio Museum in Harlem when I had a residency there. And that's a place where the studio became a site where, where multiple tenses of time tended to collapse into a single image. Like we see here a portrait of Katie, but also, you know, I was interested in the making of work amongst the fragments of other concurrent images. So we see um, a portrait of Tony in the background and we see, uh, we catch a sliver of another portrait of Etienne in the front, but that all of these things were kind of, um, happening simultaneously. And this is also when I started bringing in um, uh, other references to time or what I also started to think of as like collage in the sense of time. I can also go more into, into this. But something that's also happened with the studio is thinking about the continuity of these friendships. I began making the work, um, you know, with, with friends where you know, we were all really just sort of getting to know each other. And it's been interesting to see how a lot of these have now, our friendships now entering their second and third decades, um, you know, so, uh, you know, just jumping ahead between um, Katie as a sitter in 2011, which is probably the second or third series of portraits I've made of her to this image in 2017, um, a portrait of her and her, uh, now her daughter is now three years old, um, which is kind of, interesting to think about how time passes. Here's another portrait of Victor from 2010 to a portrait in a, re or I guess I could think of this as sort of a portrait in a work that was in a sh the, the show I did a year ago um, here in Los Angeles at Veal Netter, which opened the day that everything shut down. So it, it I spent a year and a half working on this. <laughs> it was installed and then everything sat. It was like being entombed. Um, but anyways, we start to see this way also in which this, the, 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 the setting, the making of portraiture becomes a stage that, that moved from 
this place where I had intended to set things up in order to get to know them, that quickly transforms not only into a site that kind of accumulates um, all of these, all of this type of material. Like for example, in this image, we have like, you know, I recall this is my friend Jeffrey's boots that were left behind. This is sort of like a still life made at this spot that is now everything has sort of fallen. This is, uh, you know, another fragment of the portrait of Tony. These are old bed sheets that I had brought from home to use as backdrops. Here we have a sliver of a self portrait that I made that previous December. But as the as work and the 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 uh, the work get begins to go out into the world, I would I became really interested or having to really figure out what it meant then for the site of the work and the practice to be a place in which people projected their own sort of desire and wanting to connect. And that's, I can talk about that also more later. So the stage becomes sort of this two-way thing. Um, jumping ahead to, to grad school, when I moved back to Los Angeles in 2014, this is a work that was in my thesis show. And this kind of gets to these qu current questions of like absence, presence, touch, trace, and also the mirrors. I'm not gonna explain how, go into how the mirrors came into the work, but I can if anyone's interested. But I think of this image, a ground, the title is a ground file 0083. It's also sort of like a, a portrait portrait of trace that's kind of both, that's for the most part invisible of the presence of my friend Evan. I became interested in the, in I was using all these backdrops, this sort of staging of mid early 20th century like studio photography. Hence we see this sort of like lame um, uh, fabrics used. You know, I'm thinking about like George Pat Lyons studio and all of these sort of 20th century, early 20th century kind of like homoerotic or like Vogue type photographs. But that this was an image made after my friend Evan had sat for a portrait where, where if you were to see this in person, it's hard to come through over, over Zoom and also through JPEGs, is you're almost able to kind of catch a glimpse of like the smudges, the trace left of his body print on this mirror. You can kind of catch it where you, where the black edge of this photo reflector caught in the reflection starts to get smudged out. You can sort of see that there. And this thing started happening where I started realizing that with the use and the construction of these backdrops and the, these props and things, they, I was either able to work with um, this kind of staging that really became images of, of absence or before and after the setup, the event all kind of get mixed up or the using of these black fabrics as this sort of material that I could kind of merge into and out of. Again, another topic which we can kind of talk about more, but I'm gonna jump quick ahead to sort of show you some recent portraits that are using this, that I, where I continue to use the staging of the these black velvets, mirrors, et cetera. Um, so you can kind of see where the trace and touch develops on the mirror's surface. Um, just to give a context, like for example, in this, in this image, this portrait of Jerome here, the backdrop here, what you see is actually a mirror, is actually the, a mirror that is sort of reflecting the space here. We see this black backdrop. This double portrait with Dorian here, um, they and I are standing in front of, we're seeing a, completely the reflection of a mirror, but one in which this trace and touch would have come from maybe some other images that we made or just my hands on there doing some other kind of work. Here, Emerson is fully sort of in front of this black backdrop. But something that, that you can see, in, particularly in images like this, is um, extends from these kind of like staging of works in the studio where I began thinking about not only crossing the bound, like the, the line of what the space that's intended to see by the backdrop and then the, by extension, what is the space that's, that's constructed not to be seen, um, but, the, but the ways in which exists, you know, there's sort of like a play and interesting thing that could happen in that space. This leads into this questions of language around dark room, dark cloth, um, both through photography and through the sort of like erotic social spaces, but also realizing what you sort of see here that I'm that I really begin to play with is that that um, I guess I wish I actually I'm realizing I'm missing an image that would have been nice to put in here, but 
there was a point where I began making photographs inside this space here. If we jump back to this image, there's a whole series of works that I made, not from this outside space, but within this space, because here we have a mirror and here we have this backdrop. And what happens when with, with black material, black bodies, black velvet, et cetera, it is, a, it is it allowed for making visible all of this latent traces that are held on the surface of the mirror, which are this thing that they both encapsulate absence, presence, et cetera. So this is where I'm really kind of like, you know, a lot of work really expanded off of that dark room idea. Um, and now here are some more recent works, these, these studio works where I'm really thinking about kind of like the staging, an image where, you know, we can see my hands here kind of holding and positioning this, this uh, sort of mirrored stage flat. Um, that's the one kind of like real or in the moment presence, but through angling it, I'm able to reflect back into the frame this uh, 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 test a full scale test print. <laughs> I always love using outtakes and test strips and stuff like that of a double portrait of again of me and my friend Jerome here. How this other test strip brings in another element of the space. So really this, you know, this one really kind of expands on that as well. Um, thinking about staging, the, the, the studio becomes a stage, becomes a place that contains multiple tenses of time. It contains both actual presence, but also it can reincorporate fragments of images and material that it came before it. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like things that I'm thinking through. Um, I mean, one of many things. And then I'm, these last few images are, are some that are gonna be in the show opening next week. Um, this is a set of four works. They're small, um, they'll be matted and framed. Um, just also again, thinking about sort of the staging of the studio. And again, of course, you know, using the, the camera tripod, these backdrops and my own body or the bodies of others as a way of, um, of, of revealing these surfaces. So, and then I'm gonna end it with this, I think this next image. Yeah, we're just gonna end here. Um, or I mean, not end it, but hand it over to questions, conversations, all of that stuff. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, before we start with the Q&A, just wanna say on behalf of the community here at the School of Art at UARC, thank you for talking about your work with all of us. and for participating in individual studio visits. It's always helpful to gain some insight. Um, but for the first question that we have up, mm -hmm. um, the shift to using a mirror into your practice as a way to figure out the use of fragmented information may seem simple, but it introduces new relationships and connections. In what ways do you feel like a work is fully resolved? Ooh, great question. Okay, I'm gonna... This is a point where I'm gonna to jump to like all the slides that I'm not, that I didn't show prior. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, that was that's precisely right. Like the, the introduction of the mirrors was a way to resolve image fragments. So, you know, the earliest work, like, you know, not even, you know, like a lot of these early portraits and stuff, this was all made with an with an idea that like as a, you know, that photography provided like um definitive, concrete, kind of like it, it, it affixes meaning, right? And when the work, when things became much more complicated, I kind of let that, I had to let that go. But, you know, there were these years and I, there's this whole other part that sometimes I talk about just using, making use of like outtakes, <laughs> unresolved things, imperfection. And so what I wanna say is for the, for about four, three or four years, I made work outside of a studio. I didn't have a studio and I didn't have access to um, uh, space, uh, the facilities to make finished work, so to speak, right? So I made, I returned to my earliest kind of zine making strategies 
zines, <laughs> you know, just like stealing the copier at work. Um, and, but I, I got like a little photocopier from Staples, a 99 cent, I mean, the laser printer. And I began just like outputting everything I made in a very loose way. Blackberry photos, I think it's before I even had an iPhone to my first DSLR. And so what I carried with me, because I had these three years where I didn't know what I was doing. I was kind of like still making work, but I didn't have a clear project. This is the all of this unresolved material that eventually found its way to the mirror surface. So this was actual just sort of fragments of things, right? And I'm gonna skip past this sort of book references, which I can also come back to, but anyone who's made a big move, you know, you probably understand like having baggage, like, and this was, this these fragments were boxes and boxes of literal baggage, just print out material. And so the mirrors came in because I wanted to return to that initial, I wanted to find some way of return to that initial faith that, that photographs could help me answer questions. And so I went to Home Depot and I put these mirrors in the back of my, of my car. They were just like 36, I think by 60 mirrors from Home Depot. Cause I could fill my studio with a few of them. And I had a surface on which I could start to reorganize all of these, this print material, these fragments in an image that I could think of having like a single, um, I, could, I could kind of have like one single formal composition. And for that moment, I could have something that felt definitive to me before I let them go. And so that's where, and it was also really important, I'll end it on this, is that I didn't want this to be tricky. I didn't want this to be images that were kind of like pretending to be something else. I wanted everything to be visible. This is why I didn't clean the mirror's surface. And also that I was I was having to look at myself and, incorpor and, and I was incorporated into the images as I was making them. For the most part, I put the camera on a timer when it was time to shoot the picture and walked away, but there are those where I remain. So this is where all of that begins and where you start to see the, the, the traces on the mirror surface from the working of my hands that turns into thinking about how I can incorporate um, uh, uh, latency and other kind of like a, an accumulation of social information and traces. So yeah, maybe I answered more than what you were asking, but that's how the mirrors came in and, and how it relates to like photographic kind of certainty. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just kind of transitioning into like another question based off of your studio practice. Um, so the scale of your photographs are important when you make your work. Um, so kind of what is the intention behind this decision? And to expand upon that, is it to place the viewer like within the photograph, which begins to open itself up to a level of intimacy between the viewer and the subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another great question. And it's good that I have these pictures up. So. If you can see here, this work is 60 by 80. Um, even though it's funny, because this is one of the mirrors that I photographed on, but it's covered with stuff. I don't know how, I spent like a whole quarter in school figuring out optics and lens length and all this stuff with my RZ that I was shooting with at the time. And I'm not like a camera nerd tech person. I like, I'm like, whatever. But what I wanted was that in the resulting image that the scale of the camera tripod apparatus would approximate your physical relationship to it, like this idea of the implication of this thing aimed at you. So I wanted there to be a sculptural relationship for many of these works, combined with the fact that as you look at them and you start to realize that you're not looking at a photograph made by one camera of another, but that you're looking at its photograph of itself, that there's a mirror, that then it's completely enclosed that you're not actually implicated in this, that like you're completely disregarded as a viewer. And then, but also with this thing where it's like, if you're standing in front of a mirror, you should also be incorporated into it and you're not. So it's this like, you do you want to enter into the space? Do you want to have a relationship to the subjects and the material or not? So that was one thing. And that's continued throughout like works like, um, do, 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 sorry, jumping all around, works like these. Um, 
if I go to full screen. Like these works, like these 50 by 75 ones, the, the form, the figure tends to correspond to this, uh, uh, an approximate life size scale is what's kind of like happening in these. Now, there's another thing. So if we go back, let's see, actually, I'm gonna, <laughs> sorry for all the jumping around. But if we go to some of these like collage works, there's another thing that's happening. So in these here, at 34 by 51, whatever's on the surface of the mirror corresponds to life size. So these cut and pasted fragments on the surface of the mirror at when this print is printed at the size are the size they are in real life. This sliver of my arm here is the size, like if I were to walk up to it, my forearm would be that size. So in a sense, they become extractions of the mirror surface, the ability of the photograph to take something from one element in the studio and like move it somewhere else, thinking about it in relationship to time. And then the last thing with scale is now I'll jump to some installation views because, um, and maybe these ones you can see, I also make these photographs that are like, um, 11 or 10 by 13 and they're matted and framed. So the, re the reason I have these ones is when I was making, when I was first showing these ones that are the larger scale collage mirror studies, people thought they were digital. And there's this like way in which we kind of rush to kind of thinking of things through a digital space and all of that. What's, you know, Photoshop layers on and off. But I worked with Mary Kelly here at UCLA and she's always in her form of critique, she's always like everything outside of and up to the frame is as important or has as much meaning as what's inside of it. So I wanted to have two things happen. The 10 by 13 is a historic album scale at the moment of the late 20, 19th, early 20th century when photographs are, and I was thinking particularly of like private albums and the, that, there's the, there's this thing where they're moving between um, the album, but photography has not yet become artwork for the wall. And there's this, you know, and also thinking about like eroticism connected to that. And so, and it, it was also based on a historic album size, but also framing strategy. So that when you walked into the space, everything from the frame into the image was placing it in a conversation with, let's say Paul Outerbridge and Edward Steichen which I think is a really confusing thing when you see these like queer black photos to have it directly go there rather than like present and futurity. Like I'm interested in like the future, but like I'm interested in kind of going back and undoing um, or questioning the photo canon history and making a space there. So that's why scale comes into, I want them all to work together. Like life-size figures back then back to this album than to the wall. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, yeah, cool. So I think my question actually relates uh, to some of these works that we've been looking at. Uh, my question concerns the role of collage in your work. So mm -hmm. within the work, um, some of the forms that exist are fragments or abstractions, like the pieces of other photos. Mm -hmm. And although abstracted, the, the forms are not non-representational. Um, they are emphatically representational. And you know, within abstraction, sometimes the subject that is getting abstracted, you know, becomes reducible only to shape or color. And so I was curious if there was a tension there that you were wanting to point us to or that interests you when making your work? Oh, another great question. This was one of those that's like, it's, <laughs> it kind of like came up in one of those like grad school crits that is just like so memorable. It was like the first crit of like my, of my second year and like Kathy, Kathy Opie and Jennifer Belandi were like writing this crit 
crit class and Kathy was like, is this what queer photography has come to? And what <laughs> she was referring to is, so fragmentation came into the work because of this use of everything in the studio from like the ways in which these became fragments, but they're all just like, material that I had around like and they're based on like the conventions of whatever paper size and whatever thing I had helpful and it's I was interested in the ways in which things just tended to collide and overlap and stuff like that so and that's the material I brought to this type of fragmentation which is the thing that she was just like no this is not going to be your thesis and I was like Ooh, you know okay because it's like okay there there is always, I mean, there's everything from the ground up in photography. I mean, unless we're gonna really get into like, like Joni Byron's like reworking of the language of photography, like there's violence in there, right? So if there's going to be fragmentation, was it gonna be fragmentation that was just like, here's what my, the printer that I have accessible to me will do when I wanna make something tiled up, scaled up or shrunken down? Like, or do I need to move towards something where if I'm going to work with, with fragmentation, that at least there's a gesture that's account that I'm accountable towards through cutting and tearing, not to necessarily psychoanalyze every cut, but that at least it came back to something that I have to be accountable for. So that was like number one with that. Another thing is that since these works, even with this type of fragmentation in it, like I was actually interested in a in a contradiction, like one making compositions that themselves are like formally interesting, but as an outside observer, you might not have clues to what is what. Like I also had this these really great studio business with Uda Bark and she was just like, how is the viewer supposed to make sense of this? And I was like, well, maybe here in my grad studio in Southern California, it may not make sense, but this was all made for and in conversation with friendships in New York City. So when this work was shown there, I had this like fight with the gallery at the time. It was my first time having a real show in New York after having lived there for 14 years and been like, now I'm coming back and I'm gonna do this thing. And they were like, cool, new art. And I'm like, no, there's a community of people who know how to identify themselves and each other and know the stories behind this and how the fragments relate to each other. And they will come in and tell you about the work. And they were like, we're the gallery, we know what's going on. But it was true. like. People could, and so I, I, I'm always really like wanting to emphasize that like when it comes to all of the, the elements of collage and fragmentation in the work, that it is dependent on the full portrait, and it and it is where 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 the answer, if you want more of it, may not be in like the artist statement, but is going to be found in like a more intimate kind of like exchange of social information and recognition. And it's fine if people can't identify it, but I'm really interested when people do. And it's a sliver. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, it's something that I continue to think about. Awesome, thank you. All right, so a little bit of a different question for you, but, um, as a queer person, I find that a sense of community is very important to me in my practice. And I see a lot of that in your work. And so I was wondering, um, does the intimacy and collaboration between you and your subjects have anything to do with that for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So from the earliest work, I mean, it came out of this thing of like, and I'm just showing like a little sliver of stuff, but I kind of decided that, okay, there's this weird thing <laughs> happening that maybe this happens to other people, but it's like having your first group of sort of like queer friends, right? Acknowledging this thing that like every initial meeting or encounter is I think in a really interesting way, not able to be pinned down between between uh, just sort of like collaborative or creative or is this maybe romantic or is this like flirtation that will turn into collaboration or is this like things just move back and forth in this like interesting way that's not structured by like, I'm like 
this is my gender and this is my sexuality. And so therefore a person of this gender is this. I was interested in photographing everyone as if we were potentially lovers because I wanted to forefront kind of like this thing at the center holding the social formation together. So a sense of community and the ways in which our friendships and the ways in which we've known each other transform over time has been really interesting. I, 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 when I started making portraits, it quickly became apparent to me that I couldn't photograph strangers or models because there needed to be like an ongoing mutual investment or interest in the work. And I've been really interested in the ways in which friends have continued to shape things. But one thing that's also really clear is none of the work has ever attempted to define anyone's relationship or to identity, to gender, to sexuality, or, or anything else. Because one thing I've learned is that I have had, I mean, like, the photograph is not definitive. And what do you do? Like, I mean, I don't want to just like completely locate this in a conversation around sort of like trans identity, but like thinking about what does it mean to have portraits of friends who have transitioned, to be in relationships with people who have trans transitioned and, trans and sometimes transitioned back and then transitioned again. Like what is the definitive image? As well as there's an impossibility on the topic of race that I've also noticed that it's been, that refuses kind of like definitions because I've seen ways in which fragments of bodies get raced based on a black and white binary and that oftentimes Asian, Latinx, et cetera, bodies have been written in as white and how black bodies become confusing when they're not completely legible in one, in one tone um, or in ways in which fragments of black bodies, something that I've played with, um, before kind of can stand in as self-portraits and I just let that <laughs> misidentification fly. So anyways, sorry, I, I, I left the question around queerness, but I think the, the structures of like, of, of, of working with the, um, the multiplicity of, of the thing at the center has, has, has been the, the, uh, yeah, a, a huge, <laughs> like the grounding of everything. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So I'm gonna close these blinds. Is this light kind of crazy on me? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have another question. I think Trinity's up. Oh, sorry, I thought Nick was first. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, yes, my question, um, nice, to meet, nice to see you again. Yes. Um, so my question is, um, how do you view uh, kind of space within the medium of photography? Um, mm -hmm. Looking at your work, like, um, with the collaging especially like there's kind of this like dimension dimensionality of space within the work um and then kind of like the parallel to that like the creation of space within that frame mm -hmm. and do the spaces like counter um like other spaces uh, like gallery spaces institutional spaces things like that <laughs> mm. Um, one thing I've thought of, let's see if we go to some of to do, do spaces. I mean, which is a works that have multiple things happening in them. I mean, I think of this. So these are two images made in my current studio space or even going uh, back to these first images. Sorry, scrolling through the ways in which like an image like this, like the space, the studio space and within in, in how it collapses into a photograph is something that can bring in, rework, recontextualize other spaces, both physical, 
geophysical and like temporal in time. Um, and there's something that I like, if in a traditional artist talk, I would have like spent way too much time talking about references. But one of those references I, I, I always return to is Lyle Ashton Harris's like strategy of these large scale collages that he makes where he incorporates not only like whatever the workings are, the, the things that are happening in his studio at this moment, but past works, works that may have already gone out into the world and had a certain kind of like history or something written about them, but that they can be brought back and everything becomes again, simultaneously contemporary and is allowed to kind of like have new, new, um, uh, uh, revision, right? So I think of like space in that sense that um, all material can be, but also that the studio as a site, as a space requires this like tethering to the outside world. Like I find really boring like studio photography that's like only so, so self-referential into the studio that it just becomes like that like modernist nightmare, right? But it, but like that it, it requires bringing in like, I don't know if you can see in these, there's all these, a lot of the elements that I have that become really beautiful in the studio are actually just like pictures from my iPhone taken like walking the streets of LA at night because there's all these roses lit by artificial um, light. Let me see if I can find one here. But like, it's that kind of thing that I feel like the studio brings in in a beautiful way. Um, in regards to institutional spaces, um, let me see, sorry, I'm doing all kinds of jumping around. This is what I was actually trying to think about in terms of the, um, the uh, like one that it contains so many spaces. Like I feel like this image is made in Los Angeles. It contains New York and Los Angeles and two years of fragments in one thing together, but they're all about like, they're psychically, they feel very sort of like similar. In regards to institutional space, um, I will admit I'm very conventional and I like making pretty pictures to hang on a wall in the space, you know? And I hope that the ideas within the work, the ways in which I can question the foundations of photography as a technology and as a history and inserting like blackness as, sub, as a subject position and queerness as like a, a formational structure can undo that. But I'm all for putting things on a wall in a gallery and I love it, just, I, just, I have to confess. Um, but, you know, so I do intend for a lot of work to be seen like this, but maybe this is a moment where I can like refer to the project that I did at the, for the Whitney Biennial, which was specifically question using wanting the institution to question its its like dependence on authorship for validating the work um, because this was a presentation done for the 2019 Whitney Biennial that was not my images I handed to the curators the work of friends who had made photographs alongside me. And then that work was 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 displayed under everyone's name, et cetera, even though many audience people coming through the space still mistakenly understood it as my work. But I wanted to use, and I was really grateful for the um, for the institution for allowing me to to for allowing us to do that work. I can get into that if there's a question about that, but that's how I've thought about about that in relation to the institution. I hope that answered your question. It did, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, now it's my turn. And um, I think we're gonna get to what you were just talking about. But um, first I wanna like maybe, maybe take us out of like the work a little bit. Um, there are a couple of things that you've said. So I'm sticking with like the theme of community and you photographed people, um, you, you even said like friends over many decades and you're talking about this collaborative way of working and also like the Whitney Biennial. Um, my question is, I'm wondering how 
how the ways that you've cultivated community have evolved throughout your career and how you're doing it now? Mm, another great question. I wish I could like write all this stuff down. Um, okay, so how that has changed. When I was an undergrad, I was making pictures of people. I didn't think of them as portraits and I was getting people off of like the bulletin board at school or Craigslist. And those were very transactional. I like had my, you know, little DIY model release. I'd like, you know, I'll trade your, you know, I'll shoot your headshots for being in my project. I quickly realized that in making work with friends, like I had this sort of crisis of after undergrad where I was like, am I just coming up with project excuses to make pictures of people because I'm trying to get to know these people that I'm really interested in? That required two things. One, me becoming a subject of the work and starting to take self-portraits, but also removing the transactional element, which is can be tricky because it places responsibility in, in being um, in, in ongoing care and mutual conversation around ethics, around how you put the work out into the world, all of these things. So I don't use model releases. I photograph friends. At the beginning, it was total trust because we had no idea if, you know, it's like, if you don't have a body of work to show people prior, they're gonna be like, how's this gonna turn out? That work is there. I've always made, made images as gifts. So there's always a, a work from the, from the sitting that is offered to the friend. Sometimes people don't want their own picture, so they, I let them choose something else. Those are sort of practical things. Moving forward, now in the past few years where the work is really being exhibited, and not just like in a zine collaboration thing, but like there is a more fuller, there's a fuller understanding, right? So, you know, I don't allow portraits to be ever used for third party you know, like they don't go out into the world. I'm very careful on what type of, like I show portraits in here, but I don't put that work out into the world outside of very careful exhibition. But also when I did a show at Saint, in St. Louis, that was work from 2005 to 2018, you know, those early portraits sat in my storage, like in my basement in Brooklyn, and then I drove cross country with them, and then in my studio in LA for years before ever being shown. That's also the thing. Take care of your work. You never know, like 15 years later, there's a chance to show it. And it was important that I, when I had conversations with the curator, um, that after she selected the work, I had to reach, I reached out to those friends and I wanted to make sure that they were cool with the work and wanted their responses before we moved forward because we had not anticipated how it would be shown now. Um, another a question that came up from an undergrad at UCSD was how the power relationships have changed over time, which is, I think, part of what you're asking. It's been interesting to make work alongside friends for so long. And there's these moments where our the, the visibility of the resulting work in relation to the larger world shifts. And so this is what led to the questions around what was shown at the Whitney Biennial, where, for example, you know, it's kind of interesting when I made this work, this up here, this triptych of work in my friend's studio in Brooklyn, I was making all this work with, with uh, portraits of, I was photographing painters who were making portraits of other friends. But if we look into this, sorry, I have really long answers to every question. We can also go much further over time. I have as much time as y'all want. If we look at, you know, this is kind of where, um, Anyways, this, this sort of like reciprocal relationship we see here. Oops, sorry. I, okay, so it's interesting. At this point, like I was never really showing anything. TM, his work was really visible and was like, he had this like whole thing happening, right? Years later, I make this work alongside my friend James, who's this really wonderful, really smart photographer and friend here in Los Angeles. And when this work was described, when I showed it in Chicago, he was, the, the person reviewing the work described him as my assistant setting up my camera. And I was like, whoa, this is, he's, his agency is being totally written out of this. I wanted to bring in friends 
since I was photographing people, I was like, wait, you all, you're my friends. You all have relationships to photography. You're also photographers or, you know, write about images. I invited friends to make images alongside me. This next slide is his, the images that he made in my studio that he directed. This is the stuff that was shown at the Whitney Biennial. We did not show this work. We showed this work with his choice. This is a portrait of me that my friend Emerson made. We did not show my images of him. So I, this is where it came into the questioning of like, through the institution of like, when the review came out about this work, the gallery got a question from a collector that was like, wait, am I getting the right one? Is this the one that's valuable? And I was like, no, I think it's really important to emphasize that all of this is coming from these very entangled relationships and that I can't write out other people's agency and point into the work that they're making or like these images. Um, and so that's, I've been trying to find a way to make sure that like everything gets, um, gets its due and that I can't make, even though it's at a moment, sorry, trying to summarize this, even though it's at a moment where in a lot of these entangled relationships, my work is getting more visibility at this moment. I think it's important to make sure that it's not denying its interdependence on these other friendships and collaborations. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Hello, hello. Uh, my, my question is um, more so in regards to how you view your own work. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, your work seems very generous at first glance, especially in regards to how visible your scenes are. Uh, but as I hear you speak about your image making process, uh, and you do reveal how you do, uh, how you construct these images, I'm, com I'm confronted by the fact that your images are a lot more enig enigmatic than I assumed. Uh, do you think that your work is more generous or enigmatic? Hmm. I hope there's like a contradiction in there. And that's, I think that's kind of about the um, structurally in the kind of engagement implication, but then revealing that it is a closed structure. Um, and, but they're very open. Um, you know, I'm really interested in the ways in which people connect to the work, um, like, you know, like there's just, I think, you know, okay. So like these images here, um, like these three, I feel like they're different kinds of sort of loops that are happening. Like I'm really interested in the sort of like, the, the sort of like sweetness of this like enclosed loop that's happening within this larger loop of the camera and the mirror surface. Or here, I'm like really interested in sort of like the playfulness of like, this is like a camera lesson, <laughs> you know, but it turns into kind of like a play on the enlightenment painting, like those late 18th century paintings of like scientific experiments. But again, it's like, we're, we're looking at our, ourselves, but you're invited in or images like these where um, there's, uh, if we, this is one of those things like in person, there's so much better because it's like, there's these, if I can zoom in, like my images in a sense are very close, like, like you were describing once you kind of like realize how they're made, kind of like collapse in on themselves. But I love how these cell phones that on my friend's cell phones like reveal this whole other, they like place them back into like a world, like a social, another kind of social world. Like I'm interested in the fact that these they find their way to Instagram and who knows and all these other things. But it also that it that you that I mean, someone within our community, within a network of friends, would recognize Jerome for his tattoo. I'm really interested in like the that type of recognition, but also the ways in which like his face is revealed and he reveals the larger setup of the studio. I hope they're both like, I hope they the work all kind of contains both things that you were asking about. Um, and yeah, <laughs> did I did I answer that all the way? Like, yes, you did, thank you. But yeah, it's a big question. I don't have, I don't have one, little, one thing to say about it. 
So I might be throwing like another big question at you. <laughs> um, this is like relating back to like getting a little bit back to the like about the photographic canon and like the history of photography. Um, so I'm just thinking about like the narrative of the voyeuristic gaze that's like inherently tied to nude photographs because of photography's history. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you navigate like reclaiming agency within that and like what you're resolving within that because I had heard before that some of your images had like ended up on Tumblr. So like how do you yeah. navigate that when your images end up in places that you don't intend them to be? I loved that um, when that happened. <laughs> I actually like spent, you know, there's, there's the kind of projects you do when you have like the artist version of writer's block and like scouring Tumblr for two years for where all of my older images had circulated was a great way to pass the time <laughs> and later on became really informative. Um, so like here are <laughs> these ones where I just took screen grabs from Tumblrs <laughs> of like this way in which my images just like ended up alongside these like all this random other stuff. Um, so, okay, um, thinking about, can, wait, can you give me again the, the beginning of that question again? Sorry, I just like. Oh, sorry, it's kind of like a convoluted <laughs> question. Um, but yeah, I ju I'm just wondering how you navigate like reclaiming that agency, like not only oh. as a photographer, but also as a subject, like within yeah. the narrative of what you're yeah. Okay, so this early, all these earlier images circulated through like zine culture. This is like, I just have a slide to just be like, there's this moment in like 2005, 2006 was just like queer zine world was just like the thing in New York. And it was this moment where I was not so careful. Like, I think not, not many of us were careful about the work. We put lots of work out there without understanding the ways in which it would get consumed and like used and transformed. I think there's something beautiful about that, but I also think we just need to have like an awareness of, of that. Work goes out into the world and comes back to us and it drags things in. Like when your dog comes in, I'll cover with like skunk. Art does that. So, you know, thinking about the complications of the, of like objectification and all of that in photography, I turn to thinking about like mutual objectification. And there's this really great writing by Gordon Hall who writes really beautifully in this tribute to in, to their friend, um, there's an essay called Party Friends <laughs> that was in tribute to a friend who passed named Mark Aguar after she passed away. And it's talking about these spaces in which like if objectification is gonna happen to black and brown bodies, to trans bodies, to bodies that are vulnerable, we all actually at points do want to be objectified, but how do we find spaces where that is like mutual mutually gratifying, safe, and allows for things to happen. And thinking about the party space as that. It's like, people wanna to come together, they wanna to look fabulous. You wanna be like, oh my God, girl, you look so cute. Like, we, you want that. You don't want it to be like violent. So this is where I started actually also thinking about like the dark room space. Um, so I, the dark room project is all based off of these two things, like the photographer's dark room and the sex club dark room and thinking about these which you know thinking about these ways in which there are these like really intimate like closed spaces that produce an initial type of of touch sense vision that the results get get um get like move into the daylight <laughs> or onto the street right but it's like how many friendships and relationships start in this space that then like end up in the line at the coffee shop. How does a photographer, but you still have that in your body sense of like, and this also extends to like, thinking about a type of mutual objectification and identification that I find in Richard Bruce Nugent's work of his writing in the Harlem Renaissance. I think stylistically, I'm interested in this graphic of his. Anyways, that's a whole other topic. But this way in which we carry this memory, the sense memory of those initial encounters throughout, but there, but there's spaces where it's when it's all good, it's all right, it's it's mutual, it's safe or whatever. So I started thinking about the dark room images 
um, if we go, sorry, now I've lost the direction of everything. I started thinking about these dark room, these, the dark room project as these spaces where, okay, being seen, posing, um, desiring, being desired is all happening in this sort of like, <laughs> in the space that is, which is that one that was behind, if I can find it. But you remember that one where like, there was several, you actually can't identify how many black bodies are behind the black curtain. This is all I'm thinking about in that space is where that can happen, where you can perform it and it is, it doesn't matter who's looking at it on the wall later on because they're not ever gonna be a part of it, but we allow them to look in. But hopefully being confronted with that mirror, it's like, oh, you're on the outside, but maybe you are a part of that community and maybe you find your way in. Um, I'll end this <laughs> response to your question by saying, I had this writer um, or a, a PhD student from Berlin actually wrote me an email asking about like, could I use this picture for a talk of the picture we're talking? I was like, okay. I was like, what, you know, this was some years ago when I was in New York. And she said she walked into this room of all these portraits. She wasn't from New York. She was in town visiting and saw all these portraits and was like, who, I don't understand why these people, why are these people here? Like, what is going on? But then she recognized someone. She recognized this guy who was another, um, who was another student in Berlin, but who was also the coat check person at Bergheim, this club. And she's like, and I've seen this person countless nights or early mornings, it's Berlin. So you're partying at like 6 a.m. And once she had that, that moment of recognition and how her relationship to the subject was organized, it allowed her to extend into the rest of the work. So that's kind of what I'm also talking about, like the, being keyed into, um, into uh, if we go into here, I'm really interested in this, an image like this being shown in New York, which is where it was intended and the recognition of Geo's tattoo here or the prior image of, that's I'm interested in like the tattoos as this way in, but you're kept out. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> let you go to the next question. Um, but I think it's a really tricky question, that idea of like being consumed and being objectified and doing it on your own terms and yeah. Hello, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah. I think you touched a little bit on the question I have to ask, but I'll ask in case you have specific instances that you like to highlight. Um, how have various audiences responded to your work and which reactions do you find most interesting or have in one way or another influenced what you did or did not do next? In other words, are there any significant reactions or responses to your work in the past that have had any impact or influence on future work? Yeah, yeah. Um, two, the two that really, or the three that really jump out are um, uh, going back to the Tumblr work <laughs> was interesting. So there was a lot of images that kind of like just sort of circulated. And it was interesting how, you know, I, the, if, if I had just like taken a picture of like a windowsill and like, you know, did that, how do I say? There's a sort of like a erasure of the possibility of like black authorship from a lot of just sort of like images that aren't necessarily centering the black subject. And they became really, so one thinking about a response to that, none of these images where my hand comes into the work would have begun if it had not been for years prior thinking about reclaiming a lot of images that had gone out into the world and simply re-photographing them with my hand and putting them back out there. Um, that's one significant way. Um, and you know, this is what leads to a lot of my position in works like these. It's like thinking about like what can a what can a black authorship depict and claim in the realm of like a black image. Um, this also just leads into me dealing with like other like 
being really interested in using in using um, moving into the fabric or using touch and grasp as a way of like kind of responding to everything from Maplethorpe to Manet. Um, another thing is the response to um, to these images where, you know, where uh, when seeing the double camera images or, or uh, collaborative images that they were, people assumed that they were um, me staging people. Anything you see in my images is actually happening. <laughs> so it, it's what led to the idea of presenting the work um, as, as we did for the, for the biennial. And then maybe the going back to the very, very first thing was just realizing the way in uh, the way in which like a lot of like queer art gets initially kind of just consumed for the for like the cheapest, easiest reasons. And like at a moment when I was more interested in what kinds of unpredictable complications the production of portraiture made that the conversation in a lot of queer spaces never, or I'm gonna redefine that, in a lot of gay male spaces never went beyond certain people's attraction to certain subjects. And so that pushed me for, and I don't have images of this work to making non-representational work for a few years before figuring out how to come back to those questions later. Yeah. Those are good questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Leah. Uh, my question was, how do you balance, um, and this is like the last question that we're wrapping up because we're running out, uh, out of time, <laughs> but- um, I have extra time. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, how do you balance not overextending yourself through your, through your work? Ooh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, I haven't figured that out yet. I mean, I'm learning to say no. <laughs> I, forget, I, I forget whose studio visit I was in earlier. They were asking how about being busy or something. I was like, after next week, <laughs> I was like, I'm glad to be meeting with y'all because after next week, I'm winding things down and I'm not doing anything for another year and a half. I'm like not doing any talks. I'm not doing any visiting artist things. I'm not doing any contributions because it's hard balancing teaching, being like full-time faculty. It's wonderful. Like every artist needs a day job. I'm glad I've got this thing locked down. Um, it's, I, I enjoy this, doing this so much. I, I love being able to be in conversation and stuff, but it's, I found it hard to set aside time for me to just continue to make work and come up with new ideas. One thing that I've done to kind of like insulate from some of the issues that can come up with that is I have a, I build in quite a bit of time between making work and ever showing it. So like, for example, like people are like, how have you been so productive during this last year of COVID and stuff? I'm like, I didn't make any work. I didn't do shit, but I had a lot of work that I still had to edit. I like being able to spend like a few years sometimes working through things before I'm ready to put it out into the world. So it allowed me to actually secretly have time last summer to just sort of do nothing um, while there was other stuff kind of like ready when some requests needed to be fulfilled. And I was like, I'm sorry, we're all dealing with this crazy worldwide trauma. Like, I, why are you expecting me to make like new work? I haven't gone to my studio in six months. Um, so I'm learning how to say, <laughs> how to take that time. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to just like have uninterrupted studio time for the next, like from May to September. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, like Leah had said, that was the end of our panel questions that we had prepared. Okay. Um, I just wanted to double check with you if um, you were fine to open up the conversation to some of the um, audience questions. And I also wanted to say thank you everyone in the audience for such well thought out questions. There's so many, but wanted to be mindful of your time. We can go for another 20 minutes. I'll try to be as succinct as possible. I just have to go to like another vir a virtual opening, but it's like for some grad students of mine, but you know. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm having a really hard time trying to pick a good question, but I think one that will be a nice juicy one is, um, so they said, I'm interested in how you title your images. I read them as maybe a system you've created to archive or organize the pictures. Can you talk a bit about titling? Oh yeah, great question. Okay, the earliest work is simply um, name. <laughs> it was just like names, portraits were just names. Here's Michael, here's Amy, here's Darren, here's Josh, here's Keaton and Ashria. Um, I started, so that's the way titling was for the longest time until making this work here, which if we see here, like study with roses at night 4K 2006 to 15, like you're like, what is all of this? Th at this point, when they were not single straightforward portraits, the work took on a titling convention that was based off of um, sort of the ways in which um, uh, uh, a reference to a subject would appear in like literature, the way in which like Truman Capote or Gore Vidal would reference names when you didn't really want to fully describe them, but you left clues for people who knew what sort of what's going on, right? Basically just to say that like, study for an exchange, and then the initials J and O, that's Joseph Osmondson, that's the subject of these two images here, with four figures. The four other figures correspond to four other subjects who are present in the fragments, those people who would have recognized themselves and their relationships to Joseph, which is David Christopher Suarez, Felix Cyprian, um, Theodore Hanna, and Shabit Simon Alexander. So this, all of this work is based off of that. It's leaving a structure and left to be fulfilled in by those people who were in the work. Another thing that you start to see in these is, let me actually zoom in to full screen again, is you see um, this sort of like parenthesis and two things, you know, in the numbers, which continues. People thought this work was digital. So I just started keeping track of them with the first two digits is the roll of film from the projects and the second two is the frame number. So this is the 22nd roll of film and the third frame from this project of studies. And it was a way of kind of just being like, this is just a single image. Like <laughs> this is a single frame, like no Photoshop. I hate Photoshop. That continued through this current work where you will see Again, now this is where it's pretty straightforward. Each one is just the, the, the file name given by the particular camera for that frame, for that exposure. And if you're a computer nerd or a camera nerd, you can identify which model camera I'm using. Like this is just a Canon 5 DSR. So OX5A7394 is just that file number. There's other ones that are made with a Panasonic Lumix, et cetera. They also are helpful for indexing because now, as you can see, works are titled just on what, how I classify the work. There are mirror studies, figures, apertures, exposures. The current portraits are simply, um, do I have, yeah, recent portraits are just a portrait. Um, and again, they rely completely on recognition. So, and, and I am very much thinking about the portrait of Christopher I made here. He has family in Texas. So this went to an exhibition in Texas because I wanted his mother to go and talk to everyone there. Like this portrait of Akeem is specifically was made to be shown in New York. They, I don't, the names aren't attached to them, but they're allowed to circulate in a certain way. So this is kind of, what the naming convention is now. 
Okay, yes, thank you. And just wanted to say thank you to Skylar for asking that question. And then um, I was thinking I can end off with one more audience question. And so this one comes from Cassandra and I can kind of like, I'll pose how she wrote it out, but then I'll kind of like summarize it too. Um, so what are your thoughts on artists making work in less than accepting conservative cities? Should everyone move to like Los Angeles or New York to make work free from closed minded criticism? Or how do you think um, your work has changed moving back to California from working in New York? Um, and I guess kind of like expanding on that question, I think because I'm I'm still super young with like my art making career. And I think a lot of um, people my age are having these conversations about like, where should I go to make art? And just thinking about like what communities there will um, aid me. And like, obviously you were talking a lot about like um, just now with one of the portraits that it was made to be seen in New York. So, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, I'm from like LA and then I lived in New York. I'm, I'm like, I'm that person who's like the coasts, but my maternal family's all from like Bastrop, Monroe, Louisiana, like right there. And it's, um, and so then I, I've spent a lot of time in, in like Northeast Louisiana. Um, but I, I mean, I honestly can't see not being in the city. I just missed LA so much when I was in <laughs> New York. But I don't think that everyone needs to come to these cities. It's interesting though, my, the years that I lived in New York, it was doing shows and projects in the middle of the country that got me by. It was like doing shows in, at, you know, uh, at the University Gallery at Rhodes College in Memphis. It was doing stuff at a project space in um, everything from like, sh uh, what is it, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and like Minneapolis, like Winnipeg, like it was, there's actually so much larger space that's like when you don't focus on just New York and Los Angeles that supports artists. Um, it was also really, you know, it was important for me to be making work within my friend group there, you know, but it was like, that wasn't supporting me. And it was realizing that like, there's such a concentration of like artists in New York and LA, they kind of take you for granted. So like, if we weren't in COVID, if it wasn't a COVID situation, like I loved traveling to, I would be like, yes, I want to go to Arkansas. I want to go to Ohio. I want to go to these places because I met so many amazing artists. And I think that it's like important to be doing that. So anyways, it's, I think everyone should come to New York or LA or Chicago for a minute, but then it's like, you know, I think we all want to go back home at some point. You know, one of my best friends here just like left to go back to, to a rural town where they're from and then continuing to make work. It was like COVID's given us an opportunity to realize that we don't all need to be crowded into overpriced like railroad apartments in Brooklyn. Um, and also, you know, like when I see, like being in Southern California, you see a lot of like, okay, here's like the same LA environment. When I see work made in like the Central Valley by like a student of mine, I'm like, yes, we need to be seeing this. We need to talk about communities in Fresno and Bakersfield and places because um, like that just seems more urgent to me. So wherever it feels like home and, and realizing that there's like there there is some kind of attention that like a big city can provide but it's like it's so much better to actually like be where you feel comfortable and have loved ones and and then just like take a few trips to New York each year <laughs> yeah so I hope that <laughs> I hope that helps all right, Paul, uh, on behalf of the audience and, uh, and the panel, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time this evening to engage with us. Uh, we, all really, we all really appreciate the time you've taken to not only share your work, but answer this, this, the specific questions we had about your practice at large. Uh, it was a pleasure to share this time with you this evening. And yeah, thank you again. Thank you. I'm wishing you all the best. Um, 
keep me up to add me to your email list or whatever of your your thesis shows it was great to see all the work in process in progress so have a good evening bye